I'm gonna be honest, it's kinda crazy that it's taken me this long to make a Futurama video. Futurama was my jam back in the day. Like, on a scary level. I had encyclopedic knowledge of this show. If you told me your favorite line from Futurama, there is a 99% chance I could have told you the name of the episode that it was in. It is by far one of my favorite series of all time, and my love for the show was never higher than that first revival season on Comedy Central, which gave us the Emmy award-winning masterpiece, the late Philip J. Fry. This episode was not not only one of the best the series ever had to offer, but it was also a statement episode during Futurama's tumultuous revival season. But let's back it up a bit and give some more context to this episode, because the journey of Futurama's production is almost as wild as the premise of the show. Futurama was cancelled for the first time in 2003 after 72 episodes. The show had never quite achieved the popularity that The Simpsons enjoyed, and after shuffling it around the schedule for a while, Fox decided to call it quits. Honestly, at the time, this happened pretty quietly, but Futurama's saving grace ended up being Adult Swim, which began airing the show in syndication alongside Family Guy. To be honest, this is a major part of television history. At that point, it was very uncommon for shows to be revived after they had been cancelled, but both Family Guy and Futurama saw huge success in syndication ratings, which in turn drove major DVD sales. Subsequently, Family Guy got a revival back on Fox, and also even saw a straight-to-DVD movie project release, both in 2005, two years after the show's cancellation. But this revival left a lot of fans asking one other question. Stewie, do you know if Fox has any plans? Plans to bring back Futurama. What magazine are you from? Entertainment Weekly. I'm gonna be honest, I slept on Futurama for way too long. I mean, I always liked it, but it wasn't always my favorite. Binging Futurama made me see how smart the nuances and subtleties of their humor were. They started throwing in serialized story elements before this was even considered in mainstream adult animation. It made you laugh, but it also made you think, and mostly I just fell in love with the characters and world. So once Futurama became my number one show, I became obsessed with the idea of the revival. If it can happen for Family Guy, it should happen for Futurama. And it did. In 2006, they announced they were making four straight-to-DVD Futurama films, and they released them all between 2007 and 2009. I was ecstatic. The first movie, Bender's Big Score, was my favorite of the lot. It was just a dream come true. Futurama was back. The show did feel a little different, but fans seemed to chalk it up to the movie format and mostly gave it all a pass. This then led to the best news possible. Comedy Central had picked up Futurama for 26 additional episodes. On June 24, 2010, brand new episodes of Futurama aired on television for the first time in seven years. I was stoked. But the first season back wasn't a total love fest for Futurama fans. The first episode back, Rebirth, had to follow up a cliffhanger set up in the final straight-to-DVD movie, Into the Wild Green Yonder. It did this to varying success. It wasn't perfect, but it was fun. That same night, the second episode of the season aired, and this one worried fans a lot more. Inagata Dalila was not super well received. And the following week's episode, Attack of the Killer App, was another of the most poorly received episodes of the series, despite giving us the most iconic Futurama meme to date. Shut up and take my money! Some fans started to lose hope, thinking the show had lost its way and that it simply would never be the same. But each subsequent episode got a little bit better. Then, the seventh episode of the season dropped, the late Philip J. Fry. This story was universally praised by fans and critics alike. It was funny, smart, and most importantly, it tugged at the heartstrings just like the most classic episodes of the series. Back when the season was airing, I would frequently visit a website called Can't Get Enough Futurama, or GotFuturama.com. On this site, fans could catch Futurama-related news and even review the show, giving each episode an aggregate score. On a whim, I went back to the website to see if it was still there, clicked the late Philip J. Fry, and sure enough, on the very first page, there's my review, 10 years ago. The late Philip J. Fry will likely go down as one of my favorite Futurama episodes. And you know what? I was right. This one is an absolute classic, and it was so important for renewing confidence in the series during that revival season. So now that I've given you this excruciating amount of context, let's jump into the episode. Let's go already! The title, The Late Philip J. Fry, takes on a couple meanings in the episode. The first act establishes that Fry is chronically late, and often due to factors beyond his control. Bender's late night hookup wakes Fry up in the middle of the night, leading to him waking up late for work the next morning. Because he gets into work late, he also forgets he's supposed to meet Leela for her birthday lunch. This tactic was used in other few trauma classics as well, like The Luck of the Fryrish, that builds the episode on Fry's streak of perpetual bad luck. Fry tells Leela he'll make it up to her with a fancy dinner at Cavern on the Green that evening. He even passes up a chance to go to Hedonism Bot's orgy to take Leela out instead. Before leaving for dinner, the professor makes Fry and Bender help him test his forward-moving time machine. It doesn't move backwards for two reasons. That way you can't accidentally change history. This was a fun callback to Bender's time-traveling antics and Bender's big score, and... Or do something disgusting, like sleep with your own grandmother. 
I wouldn't want to do that again. Which is a callback to, well, yeah. I did do the nasty and the pasty. They start to test the time machine and Fry records a message on Leela's birthday card just as the professor slips on the lever, sending them hurling into the future. Fry's birthday card flies out of the time machine as this happens and the trio finds themselves in the year 10,000. End of act one, baby, what a setup. When we jump back to the year 3010, Leela is furious that Fry stood her up again. She assumes Fry went to Hedonism Bot's party before learning that there was a horrible accident. Everywhere I looked, there were piles of bodies and then the explosion struck. <laughs> so here's where the episode title takes on the second meaning. Leela believes Fry is now dead, hence the late Philip J. Fry. The rest of this act cuts between Fry, Bender, and the professor's attempts to find a way home, and the ongoing timeline in the 3000s in which all three of them have now disappeared. There are some great tiny little detail jokes that Futurama is known for in this one too, like here when Bender throws his book into the fire. If you translate this with Futurama's alien alphabet, it reads backwards time travel made easy. The trio starts moving further forward in time looking for back its time traveling technology, and there's a fun song that takes them through all kinds of wild futures. In the Leela storyline, we see that she's now taken over Planet Express in the subsequent years, and it's become incredibly successful. I really love the designs of the expanded Planet Express building, and we see that even though Leela has some massive success with Planet Express, she's never stopped thinking about Fry or truly found happiness. Fry, Bender, and the Professor start to argue over which years they should spend time in, which leads to the time machine accidentally traveling all the way to the year 1 billion, where the planet is a complete wasteland. With all hope basically lost, Fry goes for a walk and finds the cavern on the green, where he was supposed to take Leela for her birthday dinner. Now, obviously, just a cave. He walks in and discovers a message for him, but we don't get to see it until the third act. Gotta have that second act cliffhanger, baby. The third act starts in the year 3050. Leela's life has mostly passed her by, and she still isn't happy. Suddenly, she's hit in the back of the head with something. It's Fry's recorded birthday greeting from 40 years earlier. In one of the cooler details of the episode, you can actually see the back of Leela's head for a couple of frames at the beginning of the episode when the birthday card flies out of the time machine. Leela watches the birthday greeting and learns the truth. Fry didn't die, and he would have been at dinner if it weren't for the professor. My whole life I've been mad at him, and it wasn't his fault. This line is important because it not only represents Leela's regret and sadness over being mad at Fry for all those years, but it's actually sort of representative of her previous anger towards Fry. Yes, Fry is dumb and he makes mistakes, but we saw that a lot of the situations surrounding Fry's late tendencies weren't quite his fault, at least not entirely. She was mad at him, even though he wasn't always to blame. Leela goes out and finds herself a cavern on the green one more time. She takes out her laser gun and blasts away at the ceiling. Cut to the year 1 billion, where Fry is standing in that same cavern. The laser blasts into the roof of the cave Dave created water droplets that created stalagmites that spelled out Leela's message for Fry. Dear Fry, our time together was short, but it was the best time of my life. Man, those heartstrings. This is some classic Futurama emotional manipulation right here, but it also helps Fry realize something. Though he's lost in time and potentially doomed to perish, Leela got to live a full life, and the best of it was still the time she spent with Fry. It helps Fry realize that he's lucky to have lived the life he has and loved the people he's loved. And ironically, this is the second time he's been flung into the future away from his loved ones, so he's been here before. Fry, Bender, and the Professor decide to sit back with a six-pack and watch the end of the universe. After a beautiful emotional gut punch, the show gives us a gorgeous existential sequence where we get to watch the end of all things. What a cool, freaking episode. And then, of course, we get to the solution to all this, a second Big Bang, creating an identical universe. All they need to do is move forward back to the year 3010, and they can continue living their lives. We get an awesome sequence showing Earth's history with one minor change. And in one of my favorite details of the episode, as the time machine approaches the year 3010, we see the events of a ton of classic Futurama episodes playing out. We can see the spaceships that were showcased back in the pilot that destroy New York, and then we see them again when they destroy the medieval-looking society that arises after it. We learn in Bender's big score that at least the first spaceship was actually Bender himself. After the Planet Express building is constructed, we can see the whole gang looking at a hologram of Vergon 6, which was from the very first season in the episode Love's Labor's Lost in Space. Vergon 6 is where they found Nibbler. Next, we see a phone call between Zap, Kiff, Leela, and Amy proposing a double date in the classic season 3 episode Amazon Women in the Mood. After this we see Fry and that guy from the 80s on hover chairs in season 3's episode Future Stock. Next is Fry and Zoidberg dancing on the table from season 4's A Taste of Freedom. After that we see the Professor, who has been assimilated into the other dimensional tentacle monster Yevo from the second Futurama movie The Beast with a Billion Backs. And then finally we see Leela flying out of the windshield of the Planet Express ship while everyone uses their iPhones from the previously mentioned and poorly received 
episode, Attack of the Killer App, just four episodes prior to this one. After a funny fake-out gag where they have to do one more trip around the entirety of the universe, they make it back home, kill their duplicates, and Fry makes it to dinner with Leela on time. I have to admit, I was afraid you wouldn't make it. <sighs> that was the old Fry. He's dead now. We get a really lovely final moment between the two of them. I don't really like cards. What I'll remember is our time together. This episode represents the best of Futurama. It has an incredibly fun sci-fi premise, a strong emotional hook that punches you in the gut midway through the episode, some top-notch gags and humor, and the perfect number of little nods and references to the series as a whole. It's just a classic. It does have some scary implications, like the fact that the Leela we had been following in the series up to this episode went on to live her entire life without Fry and missed him dearly the entire time. But the final message of the show is something that holds true for the Leela in that universe as well as this one. What I'll remember is our time together. This episode episode is about cherishing the time you have with the people you love. It's about not squandering your opportunities to have good times. Something tells me that after the events of this episode, the late Philip J. Fry won't be late anymore. He's going to spend as much time as he can with the people he cares about, especially Leela. And I think that was actually a pretty great message to the fans as well. Look, even if these new episodes of Futurama weren't living up to those expectations you had set for it, just enjoy your time with the show. Enjoy it while it's here. The show's been off the air for about nine years now, and I still see very often people asking for the show to come back. The late Philip J. Fry would go on to win an Emmy for Best Animated Series and is heralded as one of the best episodes the show has ever done. It even made a fun cameo appearance in the first season of Disenchantment. In the end, it sort of justified the entire existence of those last revival seasons of Futurama. The late Philip J. Fry isn't my favorite episode, but it's one that holds a special place in my fanboy heart. It's Futurama's final masterpiece. Futurama would go on to run for 45 more episodes, and there were some really great ones. The Prisoner of Benda, Cold Warriors, Reincarnation, and even the series finale, Meanwhile, all really great episodes, but none of them quite reached the heights of the late Philip J. Fry. Hey y'all, thanks so much for tuning in, and please let me know if you want to hear me talk about Futurama again. Honestly, I'll probably do it regardless of what you say, so look forward to that. Do all the subscribing business if you feel like it, and stay tuned. Peace. Johnny!